Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Live with the Hagley Historian. This is part of Hagley Museum and Library's Hagley from Home initiative, since Hagley is still closed to visitors, researchers, and staff. We are bringing Hagley to you. I am Lucas Clawson, historian at Hagley Museum and Library, along with Lucian, my production assistant and supervisor, coming to you live today from my home here in Wilmington, Delaware. Thanks for joining me again. This is the 10th edition of the Live with the Hagley Historian. I know some of you have been with me from the very beginning. And thank you all for sticking with me for 10 weeks. This has been uh, quite a uh, quite a run for us, and I'm, I'm really happy that this has worked out so well and that you all are enjoying the content and that um, we're able to bring you a good view of what's at Hagley, some of the scholarship that can be done from our collections, and some of the things that you can come learn about at Hagley Museum and Library. So today's topic, Samuel Francis DuPont, Slavery, and the concept of contrabands. This is a topic that I came across, uh, like a lot of the American Civil War topics, and doing the American Civil War exhibit for Hagley back in 2011. I was the uh, curator for that exhibit. And uh, some of the initial questions I had in all this is, when the exhibit's focus was the DuPont family, the DuPont company, and the American Civil War. So some of my initial questions were, what can we say that hasn't already been said 100 times over? And in digging into this, I found that there's quite a lot that can be said on a lot of topics. And so I'm getting a whole book out of it on Henry DuPont and the DuPont Company, the larger issues with Delaware. But there's also a lot of things pertaining to other DuPont family members and even the United States Navy. So that's a lot of the focus of, of what I've been bringing you the past couple of weeks is these topics are things that focus down in on my book, but it all comes out of the uh, research and interpretive work that we did for the Civil War exhibit back in 2011. So with the idea of slavery, we'll get into the uh, the slideshow for you here, Samuel Francis DuPont, slavery, and the concept of contraband. So part of why this is so important to my larger story and to the story for Hagley is that Samuel Francis DuPont is, is a, a, a key figure in all this, that he played a large part in, in the story that I'm going to tell you today uh, not just for the U.S. Navy, but for the larger issue of slavery and its eventual emancipation in the United States. That Samuel Francis DuPont uh, was one of the leading officers in the U.S. Navy during the American Civil War and uh, was stationed right in the heart of where slavery existed, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. And he also had a large uh, part to do with convincing a lot of his family members, winning over their hearts and minds to uh, support ending slavery in the United States. That Some of them were lukewarm to it. They were against slavery as a moral issue, but not necessarily a political or uh, economic one. But that's uh, a thing that they changed. He helped change in a big way as time went on. So let's dive right into the story. This all starts in an unlikely place and with an unlikely person. This fellow, General Benjamin Franklin Beast Butler of Massachusetts, uh, Beast uh, called Beast for a couple of reasons, one that uh, many people didn't consider him to be that pretty of a guy, but others because of uh, his later actions throughout the war. He was uh, what was called a political general, meaning that he had no prior military experience. He was someone appointed to be a general during the American Civil War because of political connections. He was a prominent Massachusetts lawyer, someone who was a, a mover and shaker within Massachusetts, and so that's how he got pushed to the fore and became a general in the United States Army as the Civil War got rolling. He had the distinction of commanding this place, Fortress Monroe, which was one of the last small bastions of uh, U.S. military holding and the lower Chesapeake Bay. So the tag that you see kind of in the uh, lower right side of your screen here is uh, Fortress Monroe, today now a national monument, still an active military post. But it's uh, right near Norfolk, Virginia, not too far from Richmond, Virginia, Petersburg, some of the, the main places, right on the James River. So it sits in uh, what's called Hampton Road, so it's where the James River comes out into the Chesapeake Bay. But that was the only little spit of land that the U.S. military still held after secession, after Virginia left the Union, after Confederate forces took over that whole area. 
So it was a pretty important little piece of land and, and quite a sore point for Confederates. But really importantly to our story, he, genuine Bridgerman Butler, as in, in his command here at Fortress Monroe, was the one who came up with the concept of contrabands. And so what I mean by all this is a contraband, literally contraband of war. So on May 24th, 25th, 1861, slaves escaped their masters near Fortress Monroe and came over into the fort. Benjamin Butler let them in, he himself being an abolitionist, and uh, their Confederate masters came for them the next morning. They asked for him to release the slaves, that uh, they were their property, they were legally entitled to have them back. Benjamin Butler got to thinking about the problem and replied, absolutely not, that he's not going to give them back because he declared these slaves contraband of war because of the legal distinction as property and not people. That that was kind of his slick legal way of, of sticking it to the Confederates. He was not known as someone who was a Confederate sympathizer in any way whatsoever. So he was more than happy to to make that legal distinction, to, to use this kind of a loophole in the law to declare ex-slaves as contraband of war. So this was a pretty big deal. The Confederates in that area were not happy about this. They complained through their uh, channels back through Richmond, the Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia, which tried to reach out to the United States government in Washington, D.C., which we'll, we'll circle back around to that. So this was a pretty big deal, and word traveled pretty fast about this. Edward L. Pierce, in November of 1861, uh, wrote about how slaves in the area around Norfolk, around uh, Richmond, found out about this, this distinction of contraband of war, and how these people would flock to Fortress Monroe, knowing that if they went in, they were de facto free, that Benjamin Butler would declare them contraband of war. And so Edward Pierce wrote, Proclaim an edict of emancipation in the hearing of a single slave on the Potomac, and in a few days it will be known by his brethren in the Gulf. He was talking about how quickly word spread about the uh, this edict and how that would work out for them, that if they could make it within the fort, make it where the U.S. Army was, because this was a growing uh, remember that Benjamin Butler started this in May of 1861, so by November this was something that was so widespread and well-known where U.S. forces were that uh, slaves knew that they could escape, get to the U.S. military, the Army, or the Navy, and be de facto free. And it was uh, also so well-known and uh, a marker of success is that uh, you have political cartoons made about the concept. So this one is called the Fort Monroe Doctrine. Uh, kind of playing off of uh, the Monroe Doctrine of uh, American influence in the Western Hemisphere. And so this is showing escaped slaves running to Fortress Monroe, being welcomed in by the U.S. Army, with uh, slave masters trying to catch them as they run into the fort. So this is a really big deal. And the military adopts this, and the government kind of de facto adopts this. That it, Again, we're going to circle back around to this, but the military are the, are the ones who use this in a big way, as a way to, to push back against Confederates and as a way to, to harass the enemy, if you will, in Confederate territory. Samuel Francis DuPont gets his introduction to all this after the Battle of Port Royal in South Carolina on November 7, 1861. That, uh, at that point, he was still a captain in the U.S. Navy, the honorific of Commodore, won a stunning battle at uh, Port Royal, South Carolina. This was the first victory for the United States forces, Army or Navy, during the American Civil War. A huge moral victory, a huge military victory, and all Navy force capturing two Confederate forts and the port of Port Royal. So a big deal, and then you, you may recall this from a couple of talks ago about what a big deal this was for the Union. But it was a huge deal for slaves in the area as well that uh, they called it the day of the big gun shoot because this was the U.S. Navy coming in with their big guns and shooting the Confederates. And it just amazed slaves in the area to see these powerful Confederates run, to throw down their arms and run. The image that you're seeing is from Harper's Weekly showing Confederates evacuating Forts Walker and Beauregard. You can see the Navy ships in the background firing on these forts. But the slaves had never seen anything like that, that uh, it was such a... Uh, a, a blow to Confederate morale, but a boost to morale of slaves who were in the area of Charleston and Port Royal. And to kind of put this in the perspective of what we're talking about, the Battle of Port Royal is, uh, or Port Royal, South Carolina, is about between Charleston and Savannah. So this was indeed 
the heart of Confederate country in 1861. So when the war began, you know, this was the first major toehold of U.S. forces, but it's, it's like right in the seat of the Confederacy. But also a big slave area because this is the lowlands of South Carolina, Georgia, a lot of rice plantations, cotton plantations a little further inland. So you're, you're going into an area of tremendous slave concentration. So the day of the big gun shoot, Battle of Port Royal, it was quite a big deal. And so they hear about this, remember about the uh, distinction of contrabands of war. Once the U.S. Navy showed up and the Army started in behind them, uh, slaves everywhere got up and left. That they, in some cases, literally got up off their plantations and went to Port Royal, South Carolina, uh, from all over Georgia, all over lowland South Carolina to get there. And uh, at first, the U.S. military had to figure out what to do with these people because not only are you trying to conduct military operations, but you've got thousands of refugees, these escaped slaves, flocking into your lines. So immediately, the U.S. military takes them in, and a lot of the people around. Employment of the contraband of war, uh, some of the uh, initial employment of these people were as domestics. That a lot of uh, U.S. military officers, Army and Navy officers brought them in as uh, like servants, uh, cooks, maids, that sort of thing. That they, uh, that they found a lot of employment among military forces that way. Also doing uh, things like washing clothes for U.S. military regiments that were in and around Port Royal, South Carolina as the Federal Army got a toehold and moved out and more people from the Army were there. You get them hiring these people more and more as, as domestics, as domestic help which is in some cases not uh, too far removed from what a lot of them were already doing. Uh, the difference this time being they were getting paid to do it, that uh, whenever the military was there, although some of these people were indeed treated not so great, uh, they were being paid for their employment and not being forced to do it as slaves. But uh, So that's, that's part of, of what these people ended up get, getting into in and around Port Royal. They also got put to work these contrabands of war, ex-slaves as contrabands of war, as laborers, that as the military pushed in, they needed people to do things like build roads, repair railroads, build camps, dig holes, all sorts of things, lots of stuff that the uh, U.S. Army does not like doing. So they were able to bring a lot of these folks in, these contrabands, and use them as laborers for a lot of construction projects. And the image that you're seeing is another one uh, from Harper's Weekly. And uh, I want to... Uh, Pay a little bit of a debt here to uh, the late Claude Green, who was a, a friend of mine here in Wilmington, a phenomenal African-American historian. So he's one of the people who pushed me to really think about these contraband and ex-slaves and how they fit into the larger picture. And some of these images were th things that are from his personal collection that uh, he gave me before he passed on uh, not too long ago. The images themselves are not the actual objects. But uh, Again, paying that little bit of a debt to Claude Green, he's someone that uh, maybe some of you here in Wilmington were familiar with or knew, and I know a lot of the people in the Hagley Guide Corps knew of Claude. But uh, employment as laborers, contrabands of war as, as laborers. The Army also brought them in directly to do Army labor, and how this is different from the labor I was just talking about is that uh, the Army brought them in to use them as Teamsters as uh, people to, to haul and move things around to build earthworks. So it's not uh, uh, kind of like civil engineering projects. These were specifically military engineering projects or just Army labor, things that Army personnel did not like doing. So that was a, a big way that a lot of these people who escaped, a lot of the slaves who escaped, came into Port Royal, got used, how they, how they ended up getting pulled into the system. Another big use of contrabands was by the United States Navy. So as we'll get into in a few minutes, the U.S. Army couldn't, when the war started, 1861-62, enlist black men into the Army, but the Navy had no problem doing so, and they had done that for a long time. So uh, these escaped slaves helped solve a tremendous manpower shortage for the U.S. Navy. Because remember, when the Civil War starts, this is a big war. The Navy had never encountered anything that size, so had to scramble to pull in all the ships that they could from every place that they could, and they needed people to man them. They found that a lot of these escaped slaves were skilled seamen. They knew what they were doing. They knew how to haul lines. They knew how to navigate, so they brought them in, used them as pilots on ships, meaning that they're the ones who helped them navigate the waters around South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, that these people were... You didn't have to train them up. They already knew what they were doing 
as far as the Navy was concerned. So it was an easy transition pulling these men into the U.S. Navy. And again, the Navy had no problem whatsoever doing that. And a lot of the distinction here, and this is an important idea to hold on to, is that with the Navy versus the Army, whenever you join the Army, you're given a uniform and a firearm. When you join the Navy, you're not necessarily given a firearm. You know, you are on a ship, a ship of war, you know how to shoot a cannon, you will be given a firearm in a case of emergency, but it's not like the Army that's a very visible symbol of a person with a gun. And that was a, a big stretch of the imagination for a lot of people in this period, is giving black men guns, and especially ex-slaves guns. And, uh, and this is a, something that the Lincoln administration had to work on a little bit at the time. But that's an important, again, distinction to hold on to in thinking about why the U.S. Navy had no problem pulling these men in, but it took so long for the Army to use them in the same way. A really important use that contrabands uh, got put to for the U.S. military was as intelligence. So what you're seeing is from Harper's Weekly called The Press in the Field, and the vignette it left is, uh, is called Contraband News. And so these are contrabands giving military authorities, newsmen, information that these people knew the area really well. They knew where the Confederates were. They knew where the Confederates were not. They Back to the idea with the Navy, they knew waterways, they knew where roads went. So there were valuable sources of intelligence, of information for the U.S. military. The military, once they realized that, had no problem bringing these people in and taking them seriously. That a lot of slave information is what pushed the U.S. military to go certain places or not go to certain places. So they were a valuable source of information throughout the entire war. But this is something that the, the military came to in a big way once they got into Port Royal and all these escaped slaves started pouring into the military lines. So Admiral DuPont's papers, and this was something that I did not expect in going through his papers in a big way, was in uh, realizing how much uh, of, of the intelligence that came from these people uh, that the Navy used. I mean, he was the commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. All that information came across his desk. So his papers, I found, were an absolute goldmine of information on the use of contrabands to gather information, gather intelligence on the Confederates in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So uh, it's, it's incredible how much the military used this information. So that's a, an important idea to hold on to throughout all this as well. So as you're seeing... The, uh, the ramp up and all of these slaves coming in to the military's lines, the distinction of ex-slaves as contraband in the war, the government has to respond to this in some way, that they're increasingly getting complaints from the Confederate government, from Confederate citizens. A lot of uh, people in the United States and in the Union are, are really thinking about this in a big way. So the initial government response was to embrace it, that it was a nice slick way of, again, striking a blow to the Confederates. So the, the, the initial government response was to endorse Benjamin Butler's doctrine on ex-slaves as contraband of war. And following on to that idea, this legal distinction, the government passed the first Confiscation Act on August 16, 1861, in which the government can take property used in aiding the rebellion. So they can take Confederate assets in any way, uh, they can take money, property, like ships, other sorts of vehicles, uh, property as in physical land, those sorts of things. But remember, because slaves are property and not people, they could be confiscated because they are property. So following in 1862, July 17, 1862, the uh, Second Confiscation Act stated that the government can take the property of people who aid the rebellion. So uh, once you get the distinction of who is military, who is civilian – so the first Confiscation Act, you know, part of the pushback on that was you're, if you take civilians' property, is that legal? So the second Confiscation Act made it legal to take civilians' property because they are people who aid the rebellion. So if you're a farmer and you're growing food, which goes to the Confederate Army, you're aiding the rebellion. You know, that's how these, these subtle little bits work in, in making the legal distinctions. But this was a way to, to push this doctrine forward, you know, as the contraband of war forward. People who are, are working toward this but in a little different way, uh, there, there's a bit of friction between official government policy and what people who are avowed abolitionists want. 
and uh, two people who were in the military and wanted immediate emancipation of slaves, immediate abolition, were John C. Fremont, who uh, was an, an American Army general, and then General David Hunter, that uh, both of them on their own issued their own Emancipation Acts, which means that as military commanders in their various areas, they just issued an edict saying all slaves are free. So John C. Fremont did that on August 30th, 1861 for Missouri, which is where he was located. David Hunter did the same on May 9th, 1862 for Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida because he ended up becoming the commanding general of from, out of Port Royal of the area where Samuel Francis DuPont was located. This immediately did not go over that well with the Lincoln administration because uh, they felt that these generals overstepped their bounds as uh, military members by doing this and that they couldn't make it stick legally. That Lincoln had quite a dilemma. Sorry, let me, let me back up a second here. Another thing that uh, David Hunter did, which infuriated a lot of people, was immediately start bringing these uh, escaped slaves in and arming them and forming regiments. They called them Black Dave's regiments. That uh, David Hunter had the nickname of Black Dave Hunter at first because he liked to try to bring these ex-slaves in and bring them into the military later because of how he liked to burn things in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia in 1864. But initially, Black Dave's nickname came from that because he wanted to bring these men in. So both Fremont and David Hunter are doing some pretty controversial things in the eyes of the U.S. government, but most especially in the eyes of the American people. So Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln, was up against a dilemma with a lot of this because for many, the war was for union and not about emancipation. So this is a really subtle point that I, I want to take a second and elaborate a bit on, that uh, make no mistake, the war was about slavery, that if you read the Ordinance of Secession for all of the Confederate states, slavery is front and center, that the reason why the states left was because they felt that slavery ergo property rights were threatened by the United States government, by the um, Republicans in Congress, other people who, who were around, and especially President Abraham Lincoln, that uh, he was uh, he wanted to see slavery ended, but pretty famously said, if I can bring the union together without eliminating slavery, I'll do that. Uh, but one of his goals was realizing, one of the, his goals, long-term goals, was to end slavery. And uh, to do that is, is a pretty strategic thing because if you take away slavery, not only do you end a moral ill as a lot of people saw it in the United States in that period, you also take away the reason for a lot of these states to cause trouble because there had been arguments over slavery from the writing of the United States Constitution in the 1790s all the way up until 1860 when South Carolina seceded from the Union. So this is a pretty hot-button topic that never would go away for the United States. So he wanted to, to try to eliminate it in some way, but once South, Car excuse me, South Carolina seceded from the Union, all the other states followed into the Confederacy, the firing on Fort Sumter, you had the problem of the Union separating. So the immediate war goal was indeed to keep the Union together and not necessarily emancipation. So a lot of people knew that, and Lincoln himself knew that, and was trying to push that forward. That's part of how he was trying to, to make peace with a lot of people in the Union. So emancipation eventually becomes a main war goal, but as he's trying to figure out what to do early on, he didn't want to alienate people. He didn't want to alienate especially the border states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware because they were all slave states and didn't want to lose their support or create battlegrounds in places where he didn't want them. But he also didn't want to alienate the American people writ large by these really controversial things like arming black men and immediate abolition, stuff like that. So, so what is Lincoln going to do with all this? So his doctrine throughout all this becomes permanent change will come from a change in the law and not by executive order, that he realized he couldn't end slavery by fiat, that although the um, Supreme Court had been more or less neutralized by the, the, the once the war got going because of the writ of habeas corpus, uh, the U.S. Congress was still quite active and they had no problem in trying to take apart a lot of the things that Lincoln wanted to do. So his bigger strategy was going to be, he's going to have to change people's minds over time. He's going to have to bring people in, change this by degree. So uh, this starts the process in Lincoln thinking about what to, what to do based on the uh, contraband of war concept. So in, in starting down the path of changing people's hearts and minds, I'll, I'll bring you to 
Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont. He uh, played a, a pretty big part in all this, especially for people like the U.S. Navy, because he had defended slavery as a constitutional issue. He said he never really liked it as a moral one, but didn't realize how terrible it was until he saw it for himself. And he wrote on December 17, 1861, I have seen the institution de pre, and may God forgive me for the words I have ever uttered in its defense as intertwined with our Constitution. He also wrote that a hog in Massachusetts has it better than a slave in South Carolina. And he was really quite shocked once he got boots on the ground in South Carolina seeing where slaves lived, how they were treated. But then also he and a lot of other Army and Navy officers were shocked when they learned that as the military, U.S. military moved in and these slaves tried to escape, a lot of their Confederate masters tried to execute them rather than see them go to Union forces. Uh, so he said that they would go into places and find big groups of slaves that had been, that had been executed. And uh, this shocked them. This really kind of shook them to the core. And uh, he had claimed that a lot of his friends were slaveholders, that he bought a lot of the, the, uh, the arguments that it was a, a good thing because they had food and clothing and so on and so forth, but saw that that was just complete and utter crap seeing it for himself. And so he started on a campaign with his own family members, most uh, notably his wife Sophie and his uh, brother-in-law Henry DuPont, to, to change their minds and eventually brought them around to his way of thinking on all this by presenting the evidence, saying this is what I saw, this is, this is the thing that's here, we need to do something about this, we need to incorporate this in as a war aim. And part of what helped change Samuel Francis DuPont's mind was Robert Smalls, who we, we've touched on before, who on May 13, 1862, stole the steamer planter, which was Confederate General Roswell Ripley's personal uh, boat in Charleston Harbor, sailed it out to the South Atlantic blockading squadron. He saw the opportunity to escape with the entire slave crew and all of their families, get out to the South Atlantic blockading squadron. He was immediately taken to Samuel Francis DuPont. So not only is Samuel Francis DuPont seeing the worst, he's seeing people at their best as he felt that he thought that Robert Smalls was incredibly courageous and brave and that he was one of a lot of people who escaped slavery and uh, wanted to, uh, to to help them out, you know, wanted to see them their situation change, that they would never have to go back to a state of slavery, realize that they weren't as they were often portrayed as being uh, backwards second-class citizens, but were indeed capable of, of everything that anybody else was capable of. And I'm putting these in pretty stark terms because these are the way people in the period thought about this and uh, the way they, they felt about it, how they argued their points, that there were some pretty awful things said back and forth. So it took a lot of convincing by people like Samuel Francis DuPont as to why a lot of these, these long-held uh, racist beliefs weren't so. So Robert Smalls is a big part of that process. Specifically for Port Royal, you've got these two fellows who, who play – a big part in changing the hearts and minds of American citizens. One's Reverend uh, Mansfield French, and the other one General Rufus Saxton. So Mansfield French was a, a minister from New England who came to Port Royal to see what he could do to help because there was such an influx of refugees. The, uh, the military, the government organized civilians to go and set up schools, set up churches, set up housing gardens, try to figure out what to do to organize all these people, and one of the military commanders involved was General Rufus Saxton, who himself was uh, an abolitionist. And so they wanted to, after getting in there, seeing it, seeing what a problem a lot of this was, that these people wanted to be citizens of the United States, you know, wanted to set up and have a good life, to portray that back out to the world. So, so what do you do about this? They initially set up what was called the Port Royal Experiment, which ran from 1862 to 65. So this is setting up the schools, the churches, the uh, gardens. It's a formal thing. And so you've got a lot of these people from New England that go into Port Royal to help set this up and organize it and help get these people, uh, instead of just being refugees in camps, working farms, doing things out and about. And part of the uh, how this worked was to take ex-Confederate property, so ex-Confederate officers, people who own property in and around Port Royal, and relocate these slaves there, have them uh, work this property. So the photograph that you see there is the uh, property of uh, <clears throat> General Thomas Drayton, who uh, was a uh, brother of Percival Drayton, one of uh, Samuel Francis DuPont's staff members, uh, but he was a pretty prominent uh, Confederate general general. 
and this was a big political move on the part of uh, the people of the Port Royal Experiment to set up on Drayton's plantation uh, to take his slaves and put them back on his plantation as owners of the plantation and farmers of the land. So there was a, a pretty big political element to all this as well. So Robert Smalls comes back into the mix. In August 1862, Mansfield French and Rufus Saxton organized a trip for him to go north, to go into the Mid-Atlantic, into New England, go on a speaking tour to uh, talk about his experience, to talk about what slavery was actually like. So he partnered up with people like Frederick Douglass to uh, go on the speaking circuit and talk about it firsthand. So this is a, another part of the process of winning over the hearts and minds of people a little bit at a time by uh, showing, you know, here's, here's who these people are. Here's what they're all about. Here's what they're capable of accomplishing if you give them uh, the opportunity. So breaking it down by degrees, Delaware itself plays a pretty important role in this process too. So as people are slowly starting to change their minds as they're seeing the successes of the Port Royal experiment, as they're seeing people like Robert Smalls in person hearing their story, that uh, people want to make changes. The Lincoln administration wants to make changes. So Lincoln was thinking about ways to try to eliminate slavery in the United States. So he looked to Delaware. Delaware, remember, was a slave state. In the 1860 census, there were 1,798 slaves, 19,829 free people of color, and 90,589 white people. Delaware had the smallest slave population of all the border states, the ones that remained in the Union. So Lincoln came up with an idea of compensated emancipation. Let's think through how we can do this. So, you know, what happens if we try to buy the slaves out, buy out their masters to say, here, we'll give you the value of your slaves, you let them go. So he asked U.S. Representative George Fisher of Delaware to introduce a plan for compensated emancipation in the Delaware General Assembly in the summer of 1862, which he did. The Delaware General Assembly was controlled by the Democratic Party, and although a lot of them weren't slaveholders, they were very much in with the larger arguments of property rights, and so they rejected the bill outright and uh, were, were going to defeat it. So Fisher withdrew the bill rather than to see it defeated. And so uh, George Fisher actually in 1862 lost his reelection bid in part because of him putting forth this idea to the Delaware, Delaware General Assembly of compensated emancipation. That's how unpopular it was in the state. But this pushes Lincoln to realize that you're going to have to take a little more forward action on this, a little more, um, little more um, umph to what he does you know, rather than trying to, to soft uh, policy things like the, the compensated emancipation. So that's just one of the things that helped push Lincoln toward eventually the Emancipation Proclamation. And there's also policy shifts that are going on in the midst of all this too. So you have Secretary of War Edwin Stanton who authorized the enlistment of contrabands into the U.S. Army beginning in August 1862. So uh, this is a really subtle thing and, and the beginning of quite a controversial one uh, because remember back to arming black men. This was a, a really controversial thing in the United States. And so uh, they wanted to do this on a limited basis. So it specifically, this, this policy in August 1862 wasn't to let any black man join the military. It was just contraband. So this is the the 1st and 2nd South Carolina regiments under uh, Rufus Saxton, who we had talked about a few minutes ago, and then pushing this idea forward. So the, one of the, the ideas in all this, and part of the reason the Lincoln administration and the War Department wanted to let men join the Army, is that uh, a lot of people in the United States felt like if we we're going to support a war for their emancipation, that these people need to, to pay their share, so to speak. Uh, and, and although that seems like a bit of a misguided way of thinking about it, it was a pretty strong way of thinking about it, that, uh, that these people need to kick in. And so a lot of uh, folks, and Frederick Douglass himself, said, let us have the opportunity to fight. Let us show you that we're willing to pay what it takes to, to pay the price, You know that we're willing to fight and die for this principle just like you people are. So that's part of what's helping break this down, push this policy shift by August 1862. So Abraham Lincoln takes it one step further on September 22, 1862, issuing the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And so what this does is a preliminary document to the big thing that comes later that everybody's already familiar with. And so this was specifically set out after the Battle of Antietam in Maryland on September 17, 1862. 
although uh, uh, th that battle-wise Antietam was a draw, strategically it was a win for the U.S. It stopped the Confederate Army moving into Maryland, stopped them from moving closer to Baltimore to Washington, D.C. So Lincoln felt like this was a good time that he had the moral high ground to throw out something like this. So this is another step in the process, the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which leads to the full Emancipation Proclamation issued January 1st, 1863. Now let me take a second to say a few things about this before moving on, that uh, one of the bits that uh, is the most controversial that often gets missed in the discussion of the Emancipation Proclamation is that this is what enabled bringing all men, all black men into the U.S. Army. So it wasn't just limited to contrabands with the Emancipation Proclamation. Any black men in the United States can be enlisted into the military. So this is what leads to the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, which you may be familiar with, and we'll talk about a little more in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but um, this is this is kind of the, the, the big step. This is one of the most controversial parts of the Emancipation Proclamation when it was issued. Another bit to say about the proclamation is that um, one of the criticisms, modern criticisms of the document, is that it uh, frees slaves in some places, but doesn't in others. And that is 100% absolutely true. And the reason for that gets back to the confiscation acts and the distinction of ex-slaves as contraband of war. So if you read the text of the Emancipation Proclamation, it only freed slaves in areas in rebellion. And so all the places that are listed where it didn't is where the army already was. So that was where United States territory was, kind of, but also where the military went. They had already declared these people contraband of war, and therefore they didn't need to be emancipated. So that's a really subtle thing to throw in here, too, in uh, how the, uh, the, the policy worked and how the Emancipation Proclamation itself worked. Word spread fast about the Emancipation Proclamation, especially among slaves and contrabands of war, that they were absolutely delighted by this because of the really bold move to now make emancipation a war aim, but also the bold move of freeing slaves, you know, just how bold that is, on top of that letting these black men into the military. So word spread like crazy. It helped push a lot of people into enlisting in the U.S. Army. One of the more famous aspects of this is the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. So if you've seen the film Glory, that's uh, the subject of that film, the 54th Massachusetts. And uh, one of the big things to help change a lot of people's minds in the Union about bringing black men into the military, but also about the whole issue of emancipation, was this assault on Battery Wagner outside of Charleston, South Carolina on July 18, 1863. It was an unsuccessful attack. The commander of the regiment, Robert Shaw, died in the attack. A lot of the men died themselves. But it showed that black men could indeed become members of the military, that these guys, contrary to a lot of popular belief at the time, could be trained as soldiers, that they could fight as soldiers. They would fight valiantly. They wouldn't chicken out and run away at the first sound of, of, of guns, which, again, were negative things to say, but a prevalent idea at the time. This proved them to the contrary. This was a pretty famous battle and uh, quite a, a moral victory for people that wanted to push black men in the military. And another victory out of all this, and another bit in changing people's hearts and minds, is the, uh, the valiant uh, work of uh, William H. Kearney, uh, Sergeant Kearney, who later received the Medal of Honor for his role at Battery Wagner for helping make sure the flag didn't hit the ground and getting it out, the United States flag out, and then acting valiantly throughout the battle, that he was emblematic of all the other men who were part of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. So again, this is a huge deal. I can't say enough what a big deal the 54th Massachusetts was. This helps push the official creation of the United States Colored Troops. So this is bringing official U.S. Army regiments in, so they're not state troops like a lot of the other uh, groups, like the 54th Massachusetts and the South Carolina regiments. This is an official inclusion to the United States Army. So they were able to, to pull men in throughout the uh, Confederacy, or where the U.S. military had already gone throughout the Confederacy, pull in through the Union to enlist these men into the military, and quite a lot of uh, men from Delaware, free men and escaped slaves, joined the United States Color Troops. That uh, Henry DuPont was uh, one of the people who organized the training camps where a lot of these guys got their initial training before being sent on to officially join the regiments in the USCT. So 
a lot of stuff going on here, a lot of changing the hearts and minds of people a little bit at a time, but the military aspect is, is quite a tremendous one throughout all this. And what this leads to is the eventual ending of slavery by the 13th Amendment. So by this point, people are ready. A lot of people in the United States are ready. A lot of people in Congress have been won over to the idea. So the 13th Amendment got pushed through the U.S. Congress in early 1865 and was finally ratified on December 6th. So it's after the war ended, but it's already after it, it passed Congress, passed a lot of the big hurdles, and, and kind of passed the litmus test of the American people. Uh, this leads to the 14th and 15th Amendments, and, and I'm grossly oversimplifying a lot of this for time, but on July 9, 1868, the 14th Amendment, which gave black men citizenship, due process under law, and equal protection under the law, and then the 15th Amendment, which uh, happened on February 3, 1870, which gave all black men the right to vote. It's used universal male suffrage in the United States, and these are called the Reconstruction Amendments because they happen during the military reconstruction of the South. But again, everything that we've talked to up to this point leads you to getting a climate where the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution can happen. So another part of this process is that once the, the, the war is, is over, you get the Reconstruction going, and this is where the uh, U.S. military went throughout the former Confederate states, and part of the idea of this was that the states were going to be reconstructed. These states had to rewrite their state constitutions to make it such that slavery couldn't happen. And that uh, you uh, that and and that uh, there will be a military uh, guards that are there. That it would be a U.S. military occupation. So there's there's a lot going on with what the Reconstruction has. Uh, the, the the goals of Reconstruction during the time. But you also have the Freedmen's Bureau that's set up at the same time. And the idea of this is based upon the Port Royal experiment. What do you do with all these ex-slaves? Its first leader is uh, General, General Oliver Howard, and uh, they're set up again to make sure that these former slaves can find property, can, can get settled somewhere, have something to do, and not just be refugees. So this is a pretty controversial thing to do, too. And you see that there's a lot of pushback, a lot of negative reactions. So this is a, a poster from Pennsylvania, which is a pushing back at the Freedmen's Bureau about what a negative thing this was. So there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of the old line ideas in, uh, throughout the United States and the former Confederacy that a lot of folks just don't want uh, black men around. They don't want these people to be incorporated as citizens of the United States. So there is quite a bit of pushback on this. You get the same thing within the state of Delaware, or sorry, writ large, against the 13th Amendment in the beginnings of, of what's called Jim Crow. And so uh, Jim Crow laws, they're uh, based upon a, uh, a minstrel show, uh, a, a guy that called himself Jim Crow. And so that just kind of became uh, a de facto way of referring to black people during the period. And so Jim Crow laws are laws that are meant to exclude black people from voting in some way, things like poll taxes or uh, property taxes, literacy tests, stuff like that. So you can see in, in some of the pushback, so this is a political advertisement from the era, uh, showing that the, uh, the Democratic platform, the Democratic Party, which were more uh, pro-Confederate, secessionist, um, uh, sympathetic to the Confederate states versus the Republican Party, which were seen by some as, as radical abolitionists, that uh, the Democratic Party is for the white man, the Republican Party is for the Negro, and that's uh, how this was portrayed in the popular press and the popular media. And so you see this pushing you in to an early end of Reconstruction because a lot of people in the Southeast felt that this was not something that they wanted. Uh, this is also, again, the rise of Jim Crow laws and the rise of uh, the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, uh, which is a whole other large topic that we won't get into today, but you see it coming out of this era. So in, in bringing this back around, uh, part of the legacy of this is that it infuriated a lot of people in Delaware, that Samuel Francis DuPont, before his death, was not happy with how a lot of things were going. He died in the summer of 1865, so he didn't get to see the full effects like his brother-in-law Henry did. And so to put this in context, Henry was radicalized by this whole experience in, in a way, or not necessarily radicalized, politicized in a way that he wasn't before the war, that uh, he uh, was more or less a, a Whig member of the Whig Party. He didn't go with the Republicans 
or uh, really disliked the Democrats whenever the war started, but the war experience really made him an ardent Republican. And a lot of it had to do with the pushback against uh, a lot of the, the war aims. But to him, he didn't want to see the secessionist powers get back in charge. So he wrote on January 10, 1865, or 1875 rather, that he felt the old regime will return someday. The country will be ruled by the secessionists and their doe-faced allies. And so a doe-face was uh, someone who was kind of wishy-washy about uh, issues on uh, labor and free soil. Uh, he also wrote the rebel debt will be paid, uh, meaning the, uh, the debt of the Confederate states. The manumitted slaves paid for, meaning that he felt like that there was a threat that these ex-slaves, that they were going to have to pay the masters back. And all the damages and losses caused by the word of the southern states paid for out of the national treasury. And the men that fought to suppress the rebellion and maintain the government will be spat upon by the rebel powers. So you can argue that a lot of this did come to be. A lot of it did not. So what's important for our story today is just how polarized this made people in the United States in the immediately post-war world that you get a lot of good and a lot of uh, not so good that comes out of this that through ending slavery you know the, the changing people's hearts and minds a lot of people just didn't have their minds changed and so this was something that Henry DuPont was pushing back against and so to, to wrap up today we'll leave you on a high note and bring Robert Smalls back into the picture that uh, he himself after uh, escaping into the United States Navy, ended up uh, getting uh, to be he was ended up being the captain of the steamer planter that the Navy sold that boat to the U.S. Army and it became an Army transport vessel for the rest of the war. So uh, he spent the rest of the American Civil War commanding the steamer planter. But when it was done, ended up serving in the South Carolina House of Representatives, the South Carolina Senate, then later in the United States House, and ended up his political career as U.S. Customs Collector for the Port of Beaufort in South Carolina. So he was there from 1889 to 1911. So he served as an inspiration to many escaped slaves and African Americans in South Carolina all the way up until now uh, that there's usually, uh, to, to put this in a bigger picture, uh, every year when the National History Day contests come in, there's always someone who will contact me wanting to do a project on Robert Smalls. If they've read one of the books about him, they've seen a traveling exhibit that is around, that um, there, there's lots of stuff in South Carolina to commemorate Robert Smalls and his positive legacy. So this is one of the, the, the good outcomes to come out of this, is that people like Robert Smalls showed what you could do, showed the positive aspects of ending slavery, making a really hard fight to end some of this awful stuff that was going on in the United States, of which Samuel Francis DuPont and the state of Delaware play a large part. Well, let's take a second. If any of you have uh, questions or comments to throw out here, let me uh, pull this up on my phone. Pardon me just a second, since uh, my uh, computer's being a little slow in bringing this up. We'll see if there's any questions or comments, and if you have any, please feel free to, to drop them in the, uh, the comments section. If you'll bear with me in just a second here while I pull this up. So uh, John Weaver wrote, the key to Butler's legal position was that the slaves had been used by the Confederacy to build earthworks and etc., since they were property used by the war effort, they were considered contraband. And that's exactly right, that um, Benjamin Butler made all sorts of legal distinctions in this. That again, he was a, a lawyer, a pretty skilled lawyer, and uh, knew how to think about this and, and work some of these arguments into uh, how he argued the point back to his superiors and then back to the U.S. government. It's a, it's a pretty interesting history. So if uh, any of you have time to, to look into that. There's a lot of stuff that's been written about it, and um, there's there's a, a, a lot of good books about ending uh, slavery, the formation of the U.S. Colored Troops, and getting into uh, Benjamin Butler and a lot of the, the legal distinctions that are out there. So I would encourage you to jump in, and if you want to know more about that, I'm more than happy to make some book recommendations for you. So let me take a second and encourage you to uh, check out Hagley's website. Again, Hagley is still closed to the public at the moment. Uh, 
stay tuned. Check out our website to find out uh, when we'll be opening again. But do go to the Hagley from Home tab, which is part of the website. That'll show you uh, videos of the content that's up, uh, fun things that you can uh, do with families and uh, family, friends, and children while you're uh, still out on quarantine. Also, be sure to go to Hagley's Facebook page where you can get updated with uh, videos, other events that are going on, wonderful pictures of Hagley. Uh, some of our uh, grounds crew were there taking photographs and putting them up so you can see what Hagley looks like now. But that's where you can receive information on events like uh, the live streams that I'm doing, other content that's going up. I would also encourage you, too, to check out the Hagley Digital Archives, digital.hagley.org. There's a pretty strong collection of materials there having to do with Samuel Francis DuPont and uh, some of the things that we have talked about today. So if there are, there are further questions about this, you're welcome to type them in the comment box. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, or uh, feel free to contact me through this Facebook page or Hagley's Facebook page, or uh, send an email to askhagley at hagley.org, and they'll make sure that those questions get routed back around to me. So thank you all for joining me again. We will see you next week at 10 a.m. next Friday for another edition of Live with the Hagley Historian. Take care, everyone.